In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel, an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judea, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now the time for Elizabeth to give birth came, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, his name shall be called John. And they said, None of your relatives are called by that name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and he wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What then? will this child be, for the hand of the Lord was with him. All right, we're looking at Luke chapter 1 this morning, where we're thinking about the, uh, the people who introduced Jesus to the world, those gospel writers, and we're looking at the first chapter in each one of their gospels. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Luke. 
It is interesting, particularly for those of us who live in this area, that the number one historian, the number one storyteller for the story of D-Day, the Normandy invasion, was not there during the Normandy invasion. In fact, Stephen Ambrose, who has gone so far as to write books, uh, he was so integral in the foundation of the D-Day Museum. Uh, he helped to develop the, uh, the TV series, The Band of Brothers, that he is so central to that story, was eight years old when D-Day occurred. But over the course of time, as he heard the story of those heroes that launched onto the Normandy beaches and worked across Europe in order to defeat Hitler, as he began to hear those stories, he said, I need to know more about those men and those women that made that happen. And so he began to spend his life gathering interviews, and he would begin to say, you were there? And he'd interview that person. Who else do you know that was there? And he'd get the names of some other people that he knew was there. And, and before long, he had interviewed hundreds and hundreds of veterans who had been on those beaches, who had been uh, across uh, Europe. Europe together and had been through the Battle of the Bulge and all of those things, even though he had not been there. In his mind, the story was so important, he said, I've got to make sure that this story is told for generations to come. The reason I say that is because there's a parallel between that kind of storying and that kind of historical response that what we find here in the book of Luke. You see, Luke was not one of Jesus' disciples. He was not inside of that inner circle. We don't know exactly what age Luke would have been at that time, but Luke becomes a believer in Christ probably through the ministry of Paul, hundreds of miles away from where the ministry of Jesus occurred. But I think what happens in in Luke's life is that he begins to hear Paul and other believers tell the story of Jesus, and he begins to say, this story really, really matters. This is a really, really important story, and he begins to be curious about some of the details and what are those things going on, and in fact, one of the areas that he's curious about is all of the birth narratives and all of the stories and the visitations of the angels and stuff like that. He says, tell me more about that. I need to know more about that. And so Luke begins with a sense of curiosity, and then he becomes a person who interviews the eyewitnesses' account. As he says here in the passage, he says, I want to give you an ordered account of the things that happened in Jesus' life, because he knew that this is a story that needed to be told from now until the end of time. He began with curiosity. The center of it is these interviews that he does with the people who are there, and he puts together an orderly account. But it also tells us in verse 4 that the reason why he did this is so that you may have certainty in what you believe. Now, I love that journey that Luke takes us through from curiosity to certainty. These are the things that you need to know about Jesus. Here's the things that you wonder about, but I'm going to tell them to you so that at the end of this story, you can say, I know that I know. I love the story that Luke tells us. I love Luke's purpose in telling that story. Now, as Luke tells the story, he has to capture this really two-level history that's going on. There's the history of the things of God that, that is up here, and then there's the history of, of, well, the regular people here on earth. And the whole Christmas story is that Jesus is going to be the bridge between the things of God and the things of us. That's the whole story. God becomes man and dwells among us. That's next week. But God becomes man, and he dwells among us here in this place. Jesus is that bridge. But as he tells the story, some of it's got to be from heaven, and some of it's got to be right here. And as, this, as he tells the story, he turns the camera, so to speak, to two people right here on earth, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah is a priest but what is really important about this passage in verse 6, it tells us that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous people, blameless in all of their ways. Man, 
How would someone describe you this week? A anybody been described as, as blameless? Let me put it anybody's spouse call them blameless without being sarcastic uh, lately? But this is how the passage of Scripture describes Zechariah and Elizabeth is righteous. Now, you probably haven't heard the word righteous used lately uh, in to describe somebody. Uh, I think Crush from... Uh, from Turtle Talk or whatever, from Dory, he used the word righteous every once in a while. I remember the, just keep swimming, All right? Just keep preaching. Never mind, Dory. The never mind. You got to find it. Um, where was I? Righteous. What does the word righteous mean? Now you see, there's a lot of different definitions of what it means to be right. I think I'm right. You think you're right. This person thinks they're right. Everyone has a different idea of what right is. The word righteous means that you are right in God's eyes. That's the one that matters. That's the one that doesn't shift around. That's not the one that changes around time. And so this is this great word that Zechariah and Elizabeth are righteous before God. The next thing it tells us about Zechariah and Elizabeth is that they are barren and that they are in, in advanced in years. Now, the older I get, the more I like the term advanced in years. It, it seems like you earn like a higher degree. Well, I'm advanced in years. I'm not getting older. I'm getting more advanced in years. What we're going to discover about Zechariah and Elizabeth is that they are the parents of John, who becomes known as John the Baptist. Now, last week in the Gospel of Mark, we learned about John the Baptist who comes to prepare the way for Jesus. And so what we discover here is that Zechariah and Elizabeth are those the preparers for the preparer for Jesus. It's a big deal. But what catches me in this passage is that they are described as righteous. Now listen, you and I, I think we can say for most of us across this room, we would love to live a life that our friends, neighbors, and strangers, and God himself would say is right in God's eyes. And so I want to kind of unpack this passage of Scripture for a few minutes this morning so that we can try to get an understanding of what it means to be right before God. Now, the first thing about righteous living, living in a way that's right before God, is that we have to understand that righteous living does not exclude disappointment or difficulty. Righteous living does not exclude difficulty or or disappointment. It tells us that these are righteous folks. Now, you would think that if you were a righteous person, you were, had the endorsement of God that says, this is someone who's getting it right, you would think that if that was true about you, that the very blessings of heaven would just pour all over your life, that you kind of had a free pass, that whatever prayer request that you had, whatever thing that you needed, God would provide it. Hurricanes would go around you. Your car would never break down. Your kids would be near perfect. You would never get sick. Your sales and commissions would double every three months you would be absolutely blessed because you're righteous. God has said you are right. But here in this couple of sentences description of Zechariah and Elizabeth are the statements, they are righteous and they are disappointed. You see, the thing that they wanted more than anything in life was a child. The thing that they wanted in life more than anything else was particularly a, a son so that the, the priesthood could be passed on to the next generation. This is what they want. And they had likely prayed for this for years and maybe even prayed for this for decades. But now, as the text says, they're advanced in years. They have been declared barren. That window is closed. That opportunity is over. And I doubt that they have prayed this prayer in a very, very long time. And over the course of time, they had to deal with this difficulty. They had to deal with this disappointment. And they said, 
we try to honor God, we try to get this right, but the one thing we wanted just never really happened. And they had to figure out how to process that theologically. You know, no, they're not the last people that have to process that question. I look at the Word of God, we read the Word of God, and one of the truths that we just have to come to understand is that righteous living does not exclude disappointment and difficulty. If I didn't know that going into 2019, I know that for sure coming out of 2019. In the middle of this year inside of our family, uh, Susan's mom was diagnosed with cancer. In the middle of this year, my mother spent a week in ICU, and it was really kind of touch and go. Susan's mom today is cancer-free, but her body has been extremely damaged by the effects of the chemotherapy. And we're not sure exactly where that story turns next. And I could look at these two moms, and I could easily refer to them as righteous women, people who are right before God, and try to scratch our head and say, how did this happen? Oh, what, what, what has unfolded that they have to go through these disappointments, that they have to go through these difficulties, that our life has to be turned upside down by these things? Now, some of you have walked with us in this journey, so you understand that. But even more of you have walked your own journey. 2019 has carried maybe a financial struggle, maybe a relationship struggle, maybe a health struggle. Maybe you hit the jackpot and it was all of them. And you thought, man, I've tried. I tried to get it right. Why is this happening to me? In fact, you, you take a look at your circumstances and say, where is my best life now? Where, where, where did that go? How, how has that not happened in my life? Well, as your pastor, I want you to know two things that I know from my life. Number one, there are parts to this I'll never understand. There, there's parts of the why, the, the, the experience here that, 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 that I just, I, I'm never going to know. Part of that reason is because if God ever tried to put his brain inside of my brain, it wouldn't fit. What I can hold, what I can comprehend is, is hardly even worth measuring. So one of the things that I have to understand is that I don't understand why I can live and try to pursue God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and yet still deal with disappointment and difficulty in my life. And instead of having the whole windows of all of the blessings of heaven just pour over me, that there are seasons when I grind it out and say, I don't know if we're going to make it. We're never going to have a full explanation for that. But I will tell you, I will tell you that even in this last week, Susan and I have spoken and we've talked about our own different journeys with this, that we have been drawn to deeper walks spiritually because of these journeys. I don't understand the why, I don't understand the how. But I will tell you that he has drawn us closer to him and more importantly, deeper into him because of these journeys. And one of the things that you and I just have to understand is here on the pages of Scripture and it's throughout our life that even if you live righteously, that does not exclude disappointment and difficulty. I want to look at another part of the chapter. It's, it's a long chapter, but I also want you to see something else here in this passage. I want you to see that righteous living is strengthened in relationship. Right there in the, the middle of this chapter, there is this coming together of the story of Elizabeth and the story of Mary. It turns out they're related. 
This, this wonderful thing that happens in Mary's life, this wonderful thing that happens in Elizabeth, of all the people that were alive in that day, they happened to be related to each other. Now, God had that in mind. Now, part of the reason why he had that in mind is because this experience that Mary was going through being pregnant by the act of the Holy Spirit through no participation of hers it was a pretty amazing thing. And she probably needed to get out of that small town because as that baby bump appeared, the stories and the yapping and the chatter would be absolutely inevitable. And that would have been too much weight for her to have to carry. And so she goes to find a safe place, which happens to be this older relative, Elizabeth. And she comes and she comes into her home and finds safety in this godly, righteous woman's home. Elizabeth, on the other hand, can you believe what has happened in her life? In her advanced years. In the midst of her barrenness, God has given them a child. Who exactly is she going to explain that story to? Well, maybe someone who has experienced an even greater miracle inside of them. And so there, there is the drawing together of these two characters who their personal journeys, their personal faith are going to be strengthened by their relationship with one another. Let me tell you, I think that one of the great missing ingredients of faith today, of faith experience today, is that we have not learned how to live our lives intertwined with each other so that our personal faith and our personal journey is strengthened through relationship. Man, what, what happened in Mary and Elizabeth's life was so profound in each other's life because they had each other. I believe it's one of the great things that's missing so many times in our lives is that we need to have people in our life that we don't just know, but that we can lean deeply into to grow and to develop our faith. We need to understand that we are rubbing off on people for good and for other. But understand, you, you in the last week have rubbed off on some people. Now, someone may say you rubbed people the wrong way, and that, that may have happened, but, but you have rubbed off on someone. You have left the residue of your life, of your faith, and your spiritual vitality or lack of vitality. You can see the footprints where that's been left, the fingerprints of that everywhere you've gone this week. You are an influential person. But I would encourage you to be looking for some people in your life that you want to be influenced by. I would encourage you to identify some people and say, I wish my faith was more like their faith. Now, let me just tell you right here at the beginning, there's nobody in this room or the next room or the other room that's perfect. And if you get too close, you'll discover that every person here is flawed. But there are some people that are ahead of us in the spiritual journey. And I would encourage you to identify some people and say, well, I wish my faith would grow so it could be more like that person's faith. Now, here's where I want you to put that to action. Okay, you cannot move in with those folks. Okay? Probably. I mean, you could ask. But, but you probably cannot move in with those folks. But, but let me tell you, your life will benefit if you will just get closer to those people. If you will put your life in closer proximity to them. Let me give you a couple of ways in which you can do that. And I'm serious about this one. Sit close to them in church. I mean, just kind of say, you know what? So-and-so over there, I'd like to be more like them spiritually. Next Sunday, just a couple of seats away. Just get a little bit closer. So that you're around them. You can be around them. And when we turn and shake hands... That's one of the people that you turn and shake hands with. You might want to find out what small group Bible study that they go to. Maybe you need to join a small group Bible study and just meet some people that would be worth copying their faith together. And then as you spend some time together, as you 
sit close to them in church week after week. Man, again, you still can't move in with them. But, but you can go to lunch together. Go to Isabella's. Get the calzone. Uh, go, go to Isabella's and say, hey, can we just talk about life? Man, tell me your story. Tell me about, about how you came to know Christ. Tell me about your marriage. Tell me about your kids. Listen, we grow spiritually when we connect our lives with the people around us spiritually. Identify some people who are in front of you spiritually and say, I want my faith to look more like theirs. And then look back. It's possible someone wants their faith to look more like yours. Don't be scared. Just keep moving forward. And in fact, probably if we were to get this right, this would be happening at all times, that you and I would have somebody in front of us that we are trying to grow in our faith from, and then we would recognize that there was somebody behind us that's trying to grow from us. That's the biblical model of discipleship. I'm grateful for people in my life that I've been able to do that with. I shared a couple folks in, in the early service this morning. Woody Gunnels was a pastor in Eunice who was ahead of me uh, spiritually and in age. He was advanced in years. Woody, I hope you're not watching. Um, he's a godly man. We, we, we'd have coffee. We, we'd spend time together. Don Pusick, our director of mission, is a person that I can speak to and go to and, and lean into as I need that in my life. Righteous living is strengthened inside of relationship. All right, well, let's, let's get to the heart of this story. I know you're like, man, already? Or, or this took this long, but let's get to the heart of the story. It's Zechariah. Righteous living, righteous living grows with increasing faith. It, here's the moment. Zechariah is in the Holy of Holies. He's in the temple. One time a year, one of the priests is selected to go into the Holy of Holies, the most sacred spot on earth, to offer up a sacrifice for all of the people. I mean, this is a really, really big deal. One time a year, one person gets to do this. Zechariah is doing it. Here he is in this moment, and then, wow, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, your prayer has been answered. Now, Zechariah in this moment says, yes. Wait, real quick. What prayer? He says, well, you're going to have a son. <laughs> the text doesn't say that Zechariah chuckled, but I kind of think that he did. He's like, that prayer? Man, Elizabeth and I haven't prayed that prayer in a really, really long time. It may have been years, decades, since they, since they had put that dream, that desire, that hunger in their life and set that aside and said, I guess that's not ever going to happen. But God says, your prayer has been answered. If you take a look at that passage of Scripture, the way that God answers that prayer is just this massive list of blessings. Read it. You're going to have a son. He's going to bring you joy. He's going to be the celebration of all the people around you. He's going to be full of the Holy Spirit. He's going to have the power and the authority of Elijah. He's going to turn people to God. He's going to bring revival inside of families. All of this is fabulous. It's, it's incredible as you read that list and read that as a parent and say, this is what the angel of God says is going to happen in your life. Oh, man, it's, it's everything. And Zechariah says, yeah, but how will I know? And Gabriel almost to a word says, well, maybe an angel straight from heaven would come and tell you in the middle of the Holy of Holies. I mean, would that work? I mean, do you want a selfie here at this moment? It's happening right now. This is the moment. This is how you know an angel from God shows up and tells you. And it's too much for Zechariah. And because of his disbelief, the angel says, you will not be able to speak. Now, I have some sympathy for Zechariah in this moment. I mean, don't you? I mean, that's a lot that's coming at him all of a sudden. He did not wake up and say, I expect that I'm going to meet with an angel of God, and he's going to give me this incredible news today. 
It was physically impossible for him to have a child. They haven't thought about this in years. And then God shows up and says, this is what's happening. It's an avalanche that comes down on Zechariah. So I have sympathy for him, but at the same time, the angel of the Lord came and said, this is what happens. And I come straight from the presence of God to tell you. Now, what was required of Zechariah in this moment is the same thing that's required of you and me. We can't settle for what we already know, what we already believe, and what we've already experienced. If we just stick with what we already know, what we already believe, and what we've already experienced, we will live stagnant spiritual lives. Let me just look across the room this morning. There is a fresh page, a new task, a new calling, a new healing, a new risk that God has in store for every one of you that's living and breathing. But we miss it so often because like Zechariah, we're like, what? We only want to we only want to experience, we only want to deal with what we already know, what we already believe, and what we've already experienced. And God says, no. Wherever you are today, I want to move you to the next place. I want to increase your faith. I want to increase your depth. I want to increase the width. I want to create the height. I don't want to leave you where you are today. I have new things for you. Oh, church, I... I pray that as we finish 2019, as we move into 2020, that you will be ready for some things that you cannot even imagine inside of your life, inside of your family, inside of your church, and inside of your community. God said, I got new things. Man, maybe you've never connected your faith and your finances before. Maybe you've not pursued a relationship with someone who could be a spiritual mentor in your life. Maybe you've never been plugged into small group Bible study or it's been a long time since you've been plugged into small group Bible study. Maybe if you've been a regular part of small group Bible study for a long time, maybe it's time that that you taught a small group Bible study. Man, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're supposed to get in that choir Maybe you're supposed to share your faith with three different people in the next month. I don't know. But I know that what God has in store for you is more than what you know, what you believe, and what you've experienced so far. He has a new day waiting for you. And it's going to take faith. Because faith says, I receive what I cannot understand. And for Zechariah, this avalanche came on him. And the call on his life was, you've got to believe it even though you don't understand it. In time, Zechariah comes around. He gets it right. He yields his life to the things of God. But how about you? Are you ready for that? Quickly, in terms of the now what this morning. Man, I want you to understand that difficulty and disappointment that you're facing maybe right now is a canvas for God to write a new picture on. I want you to understand that there's some people that you need to get close to because what you need is a spiritual mentor. And there are some people that you just need to engage with spiritually and say, now why do you hang out with that person? Well, you don't like the same teams, you don't like the same government, you don't like the anything. But you see Jesus in that person. And that's what holds you together. And that's what's worth pursuing. And then, man, maybe there's something brand new. Maybe when I began to make that list, you immediately knew what I was talking about. Hoo-hoo. You ready to accept that in faith? Man, if the angel of the Lord just came and told you, are you ready to accept that in faith? Or do you need to just have a moment that says, listen, 
There's going to be a holy, a holy moment when God nudges you to what's next. Are you going to be ready for that? Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to get this right. Not right in my eyes, not right in my neighbor's eyes, not right in anyone else's eyes. I want to get this right in your eyes. And so, Lord, man, I want to lean into you. Lord, I want to be able to walk this difficult patch of the journey trusting you and seeking you. Lord, I, I want my relationships to mirror my desire to follow you. And Lord, it scares the daylights out of me. But I'm ready to grow to the next place in my walk with you. As we continue our time of response and our time of prayer, if that's one of your three responses this morning, would you, would you mark that? Maybe just coming to the steps and praying this morning. Lord, I, I yield my difficulty to your masterpiece. I want to connect relationships, and I'm ready for what's new. If that's what is yielding, that's what's happening in your heart, would you, would you mark this moment, just a moment, by coming to kneel at the steps. Michael and I will be here if we can pray for a specific need in your life. We're more than happy to do this. But this time of response is you and God. Would you stand and would you respond?